right, that time has arrived. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks very much uh, for coming to this session. It's really an honor, um, honor to be here. Um, I'm Justin Colonino. Um, the, the badge says Microsoft, but as you can see, um, I'm uh, on the board of the Open Source Initiative. So you know, the badge may say one thing, but my heart says something else. Um, um, you know, so um, as many may or may not know, the Open Source Initiative has been on quite a journey over the last two years, um, working to try to do something, um, you know, in the, in the face of a new technology and software of how do we uh, define what it means to be open source AI. And that's in the face of many in academia and many in industry using the term in various different ways and inconsistent ways. Um, and how do we try to drive a process that gets to some kind of consensus definition that reflects the values of um, the open source community and the practitioners who are doing the work in AI in a way that uh, promotes that you know, open innovation cycle, that open source innovation cycle that we've um, all gotten uh, used to being such an innovation um, driver. So um, in this session, um, uh, you're, this is probably the most you're gonna hear from me. Um, the, the goal is to, you know, the, the, the man who's really been driving um, that inquiry over the last two years is Steph, who's next to me. Hello. Uh, <laughs> And we want to make this a bit of an interactive um, session as much as possible. Um, I'll ask a few kind of preliminary questions to Steph just to set the stage for people who may not have um, been part of the process so far. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, as we have a little bit of time, hopefully um, we'll have time for uh, questions then. Um, so to kick off, um, so, so Steph, as I was coming on to the OSI board, you came in and you said, hey, you know, we really got to be thinking about this AI thing. And this was, you know, even like oh, AI yeah. was kind of nascent. And, and so what what made you think about that, you know, coming in wow. um, those two or three years back? Right. It was before you joined, actually, that we started thinking with the board about what was coming. And, and the trigger was when Copilot was released, which was about the same time when I joined the Open Source Initiative kind of threw me off balance, uh, realizing that none of the people that we were interacting with uh, had a very clear idea. And in fact, at the same time, the Free Software Foundation, Software Freedom Conservancy, all started the same investigation about looking into uh, AI, this new space that the machine learning uh, systems were actually creating, triggering new um, challenges, bringing new challenges, especially around the concepts of copyright and, and copyleft and, and what's the role of the code that we have written and deposited into these large repositories, signing terms of services without paying attention too much about what that meant. And all of a sudden, all of that was going to be, was being used somewhat against us. At least that was my initial reaction, right? It was this copilot thing has taken the collective knowledge um, or even thinking about face recognition, uh, Systems like Flickr, we have donated our page, our faces to those uh, systems uh, using Creative Commons licenses when they came out. We were all excited about it. And then now all of a sudden there are machines up there recognizing us uh, shopping or doing things. So there were very fundamental challenges and questions for which there was no collective answers uh, coming from the, the open communities, neither from the Creative Commons groups nor the open source uh, groups and, uh, and so we decided it was worth looking into it. In fact, we called we started a uh, podcast as a as a way of teaching ourselves, mainly me because I didn't know anything, um, and um, and but also collectively we interviewed people from uh, legal experts uh, from the board about copyright cha challenges. Um, we interviewed ethicists about what's happening with code that is uh, capable of recognizing you in the streets or code that is capable of creating fake uh, images and um, realistic fake images, but released with open uh, and no permissions, uh, n uh, res no restrictions on, on use, and et cetera. 
Uh, we asked security experts from DARPA. Uh, so we, we built a six episodes podcast that I actually recommend you listen to because it's still valid and still lays down foundation knowledge uh, that it's still still valuable. Thanks. I mean, yeah, it was a good it was a good podcast. I remember it coming out and, and listening to it. Um, so after after you know returning on that uh, you know one year of, of building up that uh, that podcast, the OSI went out and decided uh, to make a open source AI definition. What was the process there? What was your thinking going in? Yeah, what was clear after that podcast is that we really the principles of open source were being challenged in the sense that it was not clear what source meant, um, what source code meant in that aspect, in that, uh, in that new domain, in that domain of uh, large language models, generative AI. And, and uh, we needed to act quickly uh, because the AI Act uh, in Europe was being drafted at the time. This was 2023. At the end of 2022, we finished the podcast. Beginning of 2023, it was clear that the open source definition alone and the, the way we have been interpreting the concept of source code was not useful to understand the concept of source code for, uh, for AI. And when I say source code, I mean preferred the, the, the form, the preferred form for making modification to the program, which is what the, the open source definition uh, point two says. So we, we didn't know. And, and, um, and we needed to act quickly. And we didn't have a lot of budget. But we, well, we know very well that the open source definition and the free software definition before came out of the work of one genius, a couple of geniuses in two different time, time periods, um, coming out with, with principles and building a community around it. This time, we didn't have that luxury of working in, in a basement like me or some, someone else working by himself, themselves and come up with a definition that all of a sudden a community would, would gather around. We needed to do the, the other way around. We needed to talk to experts that already existed, different disciplines, different parts of the world, different interest groups, and put them all of them in a virtual space. And we had very little time to do it because, as I mentioned, the AI Act already had words in there that mentioned they gave spe special treatment to open source machine learning or open source AI systems or open source models without providing any definition and any way to interpret what those words really meant. And so luckily we found um, a, a very brilliant consultant uh, expert in uh, co-design, which is a set of um, methodologies that allow for the people who are in, um, in um, to create with the, with the people who are affected by a decision, with them, not for them. Um, it, so she designed a uh, set of process, set of questions to be asked um, and worked on that together. We went around the world basically talking to people from different interests and, and we assembled them in virtual groups. We asked them questions, what is, what is what are the principles that we want to see represented? What are um, drafting with them the words? And we came up with, um, with the, the drafts um, <laughs> at cycles, new drafts at every, every, every one, each one of these meetings. That's great. And I, and we, I do have a few slides and just some you know, showing some of these you know, co-design workshops that uh, Steph's been through kind of all over all over the world, um, you know, at the Linux Foundation Member Summit, and then, you know, it's even um, at the Digital Public Goods Alliance, um, you know, co-design sessions. Um, so, so out of that co-design process, you know, I think the, the one of the first artifacts was kind of a preamble, and that preamble, um, you know, looks a lot like uh, the FSF for freedoms, uh, you know, use study, use study, share, modify. Um, how did you arrive at that at that concept as yeah. the as the end goal for the uh, for the definition? So, I mentioned that we didn't have a lot of time and to to come up with this. So the best approach that we could imagine at that time was to take the the texts that we already had, like the principles. Can we reuse them? Can we read the GNU manifesto? Can we read the page? What is free software? 
And can we say that we want those same principles applied to AI space? And the, the answer collectively came out to be a, re a relevant yes. Uh, we could, and, and all it was necessary actually was tweak. Uh, the first thing that actually we needed to agree upon was what, what the hell is a program um, in, in this AI space? In other words, if you read the, the new manifesto, it sets a very special ground rule. It says, if I like it, it's called the golden rule. Uh, if I like a program, I must be able to share it with others who, li who may need it. And uh, so it, at the time in the, in the 80s when, when the program, when the manifesto was written, the concept of the program was pretty clear and, and there is no need to explain what the program is in the context of software. Um, although maybe today we should, but at the time it wasn't necessary. For AI, it, it's actually necessary. There is no shared, there are few interpretations, few, few ways of interpreting what, what the program is. What is it that you have to share? And we settled on using the definition provided by the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is used in many legislations around the world, so it felt uh, pretty solid as a choice. And that definition says that the, an AI system is, uh, I'm summarizing, that it's, it's a, it's a computer, uh, computer uh, system that, uh, given an input, can infer an output with various degrees of uh, independence. And uh, so that's what we need to be able to study, to share, to modify, because those verbs actually, in, in the co-design sessions, no one disagreed that those verbs um, actually apply. So that was the big re reveal at the end, at the beginning of 2023, 2024. Okay, so, so once you'd um, you know, settled on that as the kind of end goal and you know, the program being an AI system, um, you, know, you, you went on and, and, and focused in particular around kind of machine learning AI systems. Why and what was the yeah. kind of outcome of that? Right, so in order to study, share, modify, and, and distribute uh, um, and use, you, um, the, the, AI, the general purpose AI, so general AI systems, um, the ones that are programmatically defined, I mean written programmatically, this morning there was a nice, interest, ni nice presentation about this. There are most of the, s the AI that we have been used to is written by humans, so it's basically software. We call it AI, but it's basically software, and that doesn't pose any big challenges. But for machine learning, deep learning, generative AI, all the modern uh, stuff that we were looking at as a challenging new environment, a new domain, there is the, the um, it's more, it, it wasn't easy to understand uh, what the preferred form of making modifications to those. Um, pieces are, and, and that's why we, we drilled it down further in the definition to talk about what is the preferred form of making modification to machine learning systems, because there are new artifacts in there that the, um, the open source definition doesn't cover easily. In, in other words, OSD section two, source code. <laughs> right, and so, um, so you're not an AI scientist, right? <laughs> Okay. Absolutely not. So, so, so then, how did you how did you go about you know trying to find you know that that preferred form? You know, did, did you have consultations or? Yeah, it was all part of the co design uh, process. We asked experts, and because uh, we we didn't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I still don't know anything. I, I just that's my my uh, approach is to ask people who know. And we asked. We assembled a pretty uh, pretty sizable. Uh, group of volunteers, like uh, aside from going around the world and asking quest people to, to give feedback, but we asked, we asked them, what, what do you need? Uh, we gave them four example um, systems. Uh, one, uh, uh, Pythia, developed by a nonprofit group that uh, called Eleuther AI. They developed during the pandemic this, this, um, this large language model all in the open, all working uh, with no special interest in groups, They're just researchers trying to imitate open AI. Sounded to me a lot like uh, Richard Stallman writing a, a, a new, a, a better version of Unix in his, in his basement um, at the MIT. So this, this we, we 
ask them uh, to analyze PTI and uh, get a list of components of, of uh, systems like PTI. So we analyze PTI blooms, um, Llama that just came out at the time, and uh, the OpenCV uh, uh, computer vision systems uh, models. That because we wanted to have a look at non-generative AI, but still other types of neural networks. And we asked volunteers to analyze these, these four groups and uh, give a vote to which parts, which components were absolutely necessary for each uh, individually for those freedoms. What, what do you need to study? What do you need to use? What do you need to modify? What do you need to share? And they voted the components. And uh, the results are what gave us the first draft of the um, of the of the definition with the preferred form of making modifications to a machine learning system. Then we expanded the the we called that first phase um, an analysis a review phase, and then the second phase that followed was take let's take a twelve uh, models like larger. We included. Arctic, um, LLM 360, Falcon, and a few others. And we asked a larger group of volunteers to say, okay, given this definition, this, this definition of preferred form of making modifications, can you go find these systems? Can you, rec can you recognize them and uh, the components? Can you find their licenses? Can you find their terms of use, et cetera, distribution? And uh, let's evaluate whether the, the systems that we know we're gonna fail like LAMA, um, are actually failing <laughs> at, at this definition of preferred form of making modifications. And the ones that we actually expect to pass, like, uh, like PTIA, like, uh, um, like LLM 360s uh, models, those actually pass. And you know the results came consistent, coherent, so it looks like we do have a definition that is working as expected and can be can be put into use. Okay, and so how does that how does that definition work? And I do have slides to, <laughs> to help if you want to walk through it. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe we should. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that came out is that, of course, in order to use a, and, and uh, in order to use the system, a system, you need to have access to the weights in a way that is compatible with the principles of the open source definition. It means uh, no restriction on use, no restriction, non discrimination on the kind of users. Um, and that's that's fairly easy, and there will you know no uh, disagreement on this on this front. That to, to use it and to share it, that's what you need. Then you have another kind of uh, um, like uh, who of you was at the mm, uh, keynote this morning? Um, uh, Gabriele presented presented the, like many components. There are many components inside a, a, a machine learning system, so. They can be grouped into, we have grouped them basically into three. We have the weights, we have code. So in the code space, what is necessary in order to study and modify is the, uh, and, and to, to use, you need to have the code for running inference, right? Without knowing how to uh, run inference on those weights parameters, you, you don't, you can't use the system. Uh, so and in sorry, order what is, yeah, Some of ahead. us may not know what running inference means. Oh, it means <laughs> executing the <laughs> <laughs> executing the, the AI. Basically, it's uh, um, getting the output uh, given an input. You need to run. You need this engine uh, for for the inference, and um, but you also need s supporting libraries like uh, tokenizers and other elements that allow you to transform the input. Like when you type into uh, and, and you ask a question to OpenAI or ChatGPT, one of those things, uh, that question gets split into tokens, and that splitting, that thing is also something that you need to, they need to have uh, in order to run that specific kind of, of machine learning. Um, but you also need, that's very important, you also need information about how the training happened, how that machine, how that system has been, has been trained is a uh, crucial requirement because without that, you can't really study it. Without knowing how data, uh, the, 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 the data components have been assembled and transformed into uh, data sets that can be fed into the training machine, um, that is not 
I mean, that is required in order to, uh, to understand where the system is coming from. And then we have, yeah, next. next. We have the data piece. Um, on the data piece, this, is, this was controversial, and, and it still is. Um, but it's clear that the modifications, I mean, the, 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 uh, once the training happens, all the data that is then fed into the machine becomes weights and parameters. From then on, the preferred form of making modifications to the system is not the original data set anymore. Like the original data set is very important to study, um, but reproducibility is not part of the reproducibility is not part of the uh, requirements uh, of of in general for open source and and uh, and for OSI. So we um, draft, and there is another issue that we discovered as we were going into the co-design process. One of the data sets that was used to train uh, PIFIA, which is one of the most open uh, uh, systems out there, was sued and uh, for copyright infringement and removed from circulation. That kind of uh, triggered another investigation, like what's happening in this space? Like we didn't know much about data, so we talked about um, data experts. And with the data experts, we realized that there are three kinds of, of data that we call data. Um, there is, there is um, public data, that is publicly accessible, that you have all the rights to crawl and spider and accumulate and, and build a copy on your systems, but you don't have the right to redistribute. Um, there is actually open data. Um, open data is, is something that can be considered um, like a fact. Um, temperatures of the ocean, wind speeds, and things like that, those are usually fact, and that, that's open, uh, open data. And then there is private data data that is like medical records or uh, private information like my face or um, my, my name and email, things like that. Uh, and so when you can train systems on all of these three um, types of, of data, you can build data sets built on those, but you don't have the necessarily the right to redistribute uh, those. And those are not even globally predictable, those rights. Like I discovered um, immigrating into China last month, last week, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know, um, that, <laughs> that the Chinese government considers um, pollution data uh, a um, uh, secret, like a, a you're subject to search. I was reading the, the exclusion of things, <laughs> but your, your devices are subject to, to search also for that kind of data when you go in and out of the country. So, so <laughs> neither that safety is actually uh, seems to be actually predictable. Um, I have a question for you, Chris. I think it's a pretty yeah. uh, hot technology, and it takes a bit of notion of the opportunities and ignorance you mentioned. Uh -huh. um, I think that in terms of skills, for example, how do you define that in the first uh, iteration that is experience? Yeah. Um, how do you make that notion about the proficiency and how that goes to the next level? Yeah, I mean, this is a lawyer, lawyer question. You can probably argue around <laughs> that, but <laughs> skilled person is definitely a technical term in, in, legal, in legal literature, it's uh, in legal practice, it's, it's recognized. Uh, I, I mean, so what, what I'd say about this is we're getting a lot of feedback around that, right? It's the idea that like, hey, like this, this is too vague, right? And so then the question is, okay, like how do we make it, uh, how do we make it more solid? I mean, I think the, the general idea is if you give people the information, right, that they can, you know, get similar data sets. So, I mean, an, an example that, you know, comes to mind is if you're doing some kind of classifier for x-rays on a wrist, right, like, you know, maybe you can't share the actual x-rays, but you could say, you know, I trained it on 10,000 x-rays of, you know, this type of demographic taken from this angle, you know, with, you know, in this way, right, and that would be a you know, something that would probably give, you know, be, be able to train a system with similar, um, you know, capabilities. But then how do you, you know, solidify that across, uh, you know, billions of tokens or parameters? You know, it's a difficult question. And thinking about how to use that, uh, maybe solidify that so it's a little bit clearer and it's clear what's in, what's out, good feedback. Um, please, please comment on it, Gary. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the 
that's why the, uh, the, the, require, the strict, there is no strict requirement on the original data set in the definition. And the reason is it's not part of the preferred, the, the original data set is not part of the preferred form of making modification. Once the training happens, the data set has been, the, the, knowledge, of the knowledge of the data set gets transferred into the, uh, the training, the, the trained weights and the trained parameters. So modifications after that happen in the developers and the communities uh, of practitioners make modifications downstream with different, different tools, different techniques. They, they do fine tuning, rag, and other things. They don't, they don't pre-train from scratch, for example, because it's also technically not feasible to rebuild the same exact identical uh, trained weights from the, from the same data set. Yeah, two questions. That's a good question. Um, I, I guess, I mean, we have experts also in this field. I, I can imagine ways, I, because I, no, but let, let me, I know that, I know what you're going to, uh, where, you're, where you're heading. Uh, the, I think that it's, it may be necessary to us, for us to rethink really about the whole problem space and remove the picture of us fixing a model the same way that we would have fixed software. It's, it's one of the things that, one of the challenges that I've had from the very beginning in this process was to shed and drop all the knowledge about software and really try to merge into the new domain because it's completely different, right? All of the, all of the paradigms and, and, and similarities that I had in my mind between compiling software and building, and building training, all of those led to dead ends and, and bad outcomes. So my, my recommendation is really to think about that if there is, there is a problem in the model, you don't train it from scratch. You have all the instructions about building a similar other data model and, and you move it. I talked to other people who told me that, um, and who have demonstrated that they have removed biases from proprietary, system, from proprietary models by retraining a significant chunk of the network. So with different data, not the same data set, they had, in, they didn't, in this specific case, they didn't even know how the system was trained. They only had the uh, uh, research paper and the trained, the trained weights. And they removed all the biases, they told me, by using probably 20% of the original data, right? This, sis, this space is different. It's not software. So I, th I think what those last two questions were getting at is kind of a tension between 
um, you know, full transparency in the data set, right? And the idea that there might be, you know, some data, right? And data, like what Steph was saying earlier, data is hard to share. Some data is hard to share. And so if it's public, I think that the, the definition where this is going, if it's public data, you should be able to list that out. That's not a, it's not an issue. Maybe you're not able to reshare it because of various laws. But then there's, you know, what do you do about data that, you know, can't be shared or other, otherwise couldn't be accessed? And so, like, I, you know, coming back to kind of the healthcare point, I think the, the way that um, folks have been thinking about that is, like, is it, is it even possible to have, you know, open source healthcare if you can't, um, you know, see the underlying data? I think that's the underlying tension that uh, we're addressing. Now, yep. maybe, maybe I can yep. add one more thing yeah, before we move on. Because yep. there is, in, in here, of course, there is a, a position that needed to be made. And I, there, is, there is a tension here where, with groups that are saying, seeing the pipeline, the pipeline requires, uh, the pipeline to build a machine learning system is to start from the data, massage it with, uh, run and create a data set, cr uh, run the training and get the model weights at the end. So. All of this needs to be open. Intuitively, all of us go in the same place. In the whole thing needs to be open. Then when you start looking at it in the data space, you need, if you want to have only open data, you are immediately reducing the quantity of data that you have accessible to train systems into a very tiny, tiny set. Very tiny set. I'll give you an example. Oh, I want to try and train my, my system on, on movies only in public domain. And you know that it's almost impossible to calculate which movies have gone into public domain because every legislation has a different, has a different rule. There is a nice article posted on, on our blog, on OSI <coughs> blog, that explains all of this. And I recommend you to read it by Felix Reda. Felix, I saw them, oh, there. <laughs> um, so, you, you, can, you can read the article to get an overview of, of, the, the, of the complexity. Then on the other side of the spectrum, there are companies who are saying, we're never going to tell you how we built this, the, the data set, not only because it, there's some secret in the, in the data, but it's the secret is how we massaged it. We're not going to tell you how you, you've done it because in, this sp in many specific s cases, more data uh, makes a better system. So by sharing the instructions, they inherently, <coughs> inherently give more power to companies that have more data available. And there are two, Meta and Google. Um, and maybe Microsoft. Yes. <laughs> uh, maybe Amazon too. Right, so the, this large corporation, well, Tencent, by, by the dance and all of that. <laughs> um, so there is this tension here, and we're striking a middle, we're trying to strike a middle because we want to protect the, com the groups, the organizations like LLM360, TII, Eleuther AI, these groups that are doing research, they want and they need large amounts of data in order to build these systems. And that's where the balance is. That's where this position on data information comes from. And, and, and I saw this, and Adi, I'll come back to you after. And then Ken. data with the big percentage of things taken to the clinical and you have you can do mitigations by um, uh, trying to, to uh, for example in rabbits or Norris rats uh, with the cover on but if I have an idea about the data that is the the piece of the picture I want to see I can express the things on that mm -hmm. and you see both ways uh, you, you also see how Another problem is um, the 
Right, yeah. And this, this is not a software problem itself, but um, by European law, right, this applies then in a way that it must be screened out of certain people in, in uh, foreign countries who live also in this country. So, so yeah. every, uh, every um, model has to show that there wasn't a European problem, um, but there are people under economic pressure who have to do this work they also have to give the right. by law. I, I absolutely. I mean, that uh, your last uh, word by law is is what needs to happen. And in fact, the the requirements of the definition to come also to your first part of your comment is the requirements on transparency. Right? The 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 reveal revelation of forcing forcing uh, compliance by revealing the instructions to build the data set is actually where transparency comes in and you can discover abuse and, and uh, you should be able to discover abuse and, uh, and, uh, and um, exploitation. I think there is Eva, yeah, Eva and then, then Mark. Mark. I think th those are the oh, last Kaling, two. Kaling. Oh, was there another? Well, Eva, yeah, Kaling, yeah. and then Mark. Kaling, and, then, and then we have four minutes left, so I'd like to wrap up because I do want you to be able to tell people what's coming next. Yeah. We, we think we have uh, we have it here like that is, is safeguarded um, and uh, I, I'm not saying that it's going to be forever uh, like this and uh, the, the the definition has versions and depending on how the science also evolves I, I think we will have we will adapt uh, there is no other uh, way to put it I, the the open source def yeah, I discovered that even recently that the, even the open source definition, is version. <laughs> um, I didn't know that. I, I went to the Internet Archive, it checked uh, 1998 when it launched, and, and there was a version, different version number. There were nine points, not ten. Um, anyway, the, yeah, we, 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 I think we have it here. We have the principles represented. There is a requirement of transparency. There is a requirement of Another illuminating example came from a conversation I've had with one professor um, who, uh, who said, uh, all of one, he said, in the end, like, it's more useful for me to get access to the code that built the data set with the links to the original sources so that I can actually see how the data set has been built. And he mentioned maybe the data set should be considered like the, the executable, like the common crawl has been filtered, the duplicated, ablated, and blah, blah, blah. Mark. Kalen. Kalen, sorry. Good point. We didn't talk about this. Uh, the fact that the below this definition, there used to be another uh, component of the, another piece called the checklist, and we were going to be using that. As it's now split into a separate file. So basically, the open source AI definition is setting the general principles, and now how those are going to be implemented in practice lives in a separate in a separate document. And um, that checklist is where you would you would go and and, uh, and add more. Uh, it, it can evolve into into a document that can be used to be evaluated. Checklist right now is uh, influenced heavily by the 
model openness framework by the Linux Foundation, but nothing really uh, removes the, from me the idea that it, another framework can be used also to run, to take the principles, which have some examples here, these are not, I mean, these are just examples, and apply them to other frameworks to understand uh, the, the openness or not. Okay. Okay. All right. So, sure. Quick. Hopefully, I mean, we already have different different licenses being written specifically for data, specifically for model and weights, um, and there is an ongoing conversation now on the license review uh, mailing list, a group that traditionally reviews documents and licenses, about expanding the scope of that volunteer group to include evaluating licenses for code, for data, uh, adding from to code data and, uh, and model weights parameters. Right, I'd like to give staff the last word on, on what's coming next, but I also want to say thank you uh, to everybody for participating in the session today. I also see a lot of faces that have, you know, put comments, um, you know, into OSI's forums and um, engaged in other ways. And so thank you for, for that. I mean, it's really important that we, we slice this right. Uh, Steph. Yeah, we're in the final stretch last few weeks before we release a, a release candidate version, which it will include some cleanups of relevant, um, revel relevant comments, important comments that we have received in the past couple of weeks. And um, we're going to march towards, uh, towards a, a stable release at, to be announced on October uh, 29th, uh, Tuesday at All Things Open. Yeah. All right. But you still have time to go to the forum to, if you want to put the link uh, there, this, the next slide, I think. Uh, oh. Oh. Skip through. There it is. Oh, thanks to Alfred C. Sloan Foundation for giving us the money to, to run <laughs> these, these <laughs> events um, and to go to so many places to talk to so many different stakeholders. We've been to pretty much every continent we went through, but, uh, but Australia, unfortunately. So we'll, we'll try to cover that in 2025. And yeah, join the forum, and there's still time to leave comments and questions. All right, thanks, cool. everybody. Thank Appreciate the time.